Afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, Simon Brown here doing uh, first webcast, first for me, of the year. Uh, again, we're looking forward to what to expect from 2019. Uh, started off a fair bit of fun and games already. Uh, the beginning of last year, I used this as to say we were entering 2018. And 18 certainly was a rough year, uh, with Poloni kicking off the year trying to kill us. Um, didn't get much better from that. And it was, 17 was actually a, a, a decent year. Top 40 was green, uh, upload double digits. Uh, last year, we gave it all back and our market is pretty much trading where we were back in 2014. But I'll pull some charts of that in a moment. Um, expectations when I went to Twitter for 2019 were, were bullish. Not as bullish as, as 2018. I remember correctly coming into 2018 we had a slightly higher percentage expecting a green year uh, but certainly the market this was from december was looking for bullish um, so let's first kick off with some burning questions then we'll delve down into some regions and then we'll look at some equity and some spaces uh, that i think are going to be worth putting our cash into the year, for the year trade war was obviously a biggie it's kind of been overtaken to a degree by the government shutdown uh, and by some data coming out of China. I'll talk about the latter more in a few slides time. Um, point is, trade walls are bad. They are a drain on, on, on profitability. Uh, essentially, they're a tax uh, that is taking money out of the system and putting it into government pockets. Um, so it creates uncertainty. Markets hate certainty um, and therefore creates some risk. Uh, it hurts both economies and in truth, it hurts many others as well. Now, there will see be some benefits, you know, products that, that, that China is not going to sell into the U.S. because of trade, because of the tariffs. They might sell somewhere else at a better price and the like. But generally, it's going to be a tax on the consumer. It's going to hurt and there's going to be ripple effects, particularly if it is prolonged. Uh, will we see peace in our time? So my short answer is yes. Uh, of course, until the next orange tweet from the White House, what I'm expecting to be happening um, Ah, there we go. Uh, what I'm expecting to be happening is is that they, you know, this is this is very much Trump style. Uh, we saw it with NAFTA, lots of hoo ha, lots of bullying tweets, lots of grandiose statements at the end. An agreement which is different, but broadly the same. Uh, the big deal with uh, China very much is IP protection. That's not going to be an easy one to resolve. Uh, is, are they going to bring Huawei, Huawei into the into the deal? They've got their CFO currently sitting in Canada under arrest for selling to Iran. It gets messy, but I do think there's a deadline lurking sometime around March. I think we'll get something before then, um, because at the end of the day, trade wars helps no one. I, I know we've seen some orange tweets suggesting that they that they're great for the American economy and the like. They're not. Uh, they're absolutely not. So I do think we will get some some resolution uh, and lots of of of, of backslapping and the like when that happens. Um, what about our fallen angels? And this is some of the the, the stocks from last year um, that that had a really tough time of it. And yeah, I stopped typing when I ran out of the first row, and I carried it could have carried on going. And, I, and I've particularly mentioned Hindenburg here because actually Hindenburg, uh, the, the, the number of deaths was not as significant as many think. Um, any death is too many, but because hydrogen rises um, and burning hydrogen even faster, pretty much the fire is going up. And even if it's going past you, it might go quick enough. And what I'm saying there is that in many cases, not all, the fallen angels have just fallen back to better prices. We had stocks, uh, Aspen at, at, at north of 400, Aspen at, at, at almost 200, um, uh, NASPAS at over 4,000 that were just expensive. We have some stocks that might not survive. Send us, you know, the, the, they significantly worse off, uh, down 70 plus percent during 2017. Um, and I didn't run the number from how far down off their all-time high, but probably close to 85 odd percent. Um, and they've got a massive crash crunch and are, are, are selling assets left, right and center. Uh, Avenge, I don't expect Avenge to survive in any meaningful form. Um, so what, what differentiates 2018, perhaps, is in 2017, we had some stocks get hit, most notably was Steinhoff. But by and large, uh, the stocks that were red were down a bit. Last year, the stocks being hit were massive. You know, I mean, BTI off 50%, which isn't on my list here. Um, Willie's over 50 off the highs. Um, just, just significant 
pain coming through a number of once were darling shares. And and the lesson here is simple. And and it's something I speak about quite often in that the only thing that we can control in an investment environment is the price that we pay. We sell when we're selling, we're taking whatever the market price is. We have no control over dividend flows, profitability, fraud, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the price that we pay. And we have to guard that control intensely. And and paying north of four hundred for Aspen was disregarding price. And at that point you were pure momentum play and at a certain point when the momentum goes against you you've got to bail um eoh again was was you know you at 180 was was paying a price that was far too high for what it was mtn at how high did mtn get 250 ish and we're going back to pre the first nigerian disaster there um but it it's control that price that you pay and oftentimes watch stocks go without you. Rather watch them go without you than being buying once with you know, the darlings at crazy prices. That will these stocks, will Aspen, MTN, Naspas, uh, Willys, maybe even EOH, maybe Ascenders get back to their all-time highs again? Sure. Question is when. Yeah, and 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 it's it's going to be a long time. I mean, let's take Aspen as an example. Very much, it has evolved into what is now a a a mature low growth stock. Those days of uh, price earnings up thirty forty percent are gone. They're hoping for ten, which therefore means that current valuation of around eleven or twelve PE is fair. Um, and and these are the stocks, and this is this was up to early December, um, just showing a sense of just how bad it has been. Um, a, a lot of construction in that, uh, a lot of 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 well, not a lot of, but Steinhoff obviously on 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 just the out and out fraud side, but certainly a, a lot of stocks that at one point were were the half flyers and and were the ones that were beloved, um, and some are even worse subsequent to this to the screen grab. Um, so it, it really was a brutal 2018. And I think part of the trick, and I, I recorded the predictions podcast with Keith McLachlan and um, Mark Ashton. It will be on justonelap.com slash JC Direct tomorrow, Thursday morning. And I think one of the issues, and I raised it there, was I think we came into 2018 with lots of uh, positive expectation. You know, we had Nazarek. Uh, we really thought things were going to be better. And, and the fact that our expectation was not just met, but that was basically slapped in the face with a wet fish, I think really, really hurt even more. Uh, Bitcoin was the, 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 the one big panic. Um, it had hit 20 odd thousand. It was a bubble. Uh, I still think there's more downside. I'm not impressed by blockchain. I think cryptocurrency is a funny experiment, but is it the future of money for planet Earth? Not in my lifetime. Um, ESCOM, obviously, the big issue where we started to have uh, load shedding again towards the end of 2018. We thought that was behind us. It seemed to have not have been as bad. It was weekend load shedding, and that was really just getting systems up and running for the week, um, particularly the hydroelectric, which is requiring pumping and therefore can't be providing, etc. But ESCOM is is a serious threat, and 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 the threat is load shedding. The bigger threat. Is it just going bust? Um, and simply it can't. I mean, how we stop it is is, is not going to be easy, but a bankrupt ESCOM, we, we can't let that happen. Uh, Magda Vigisvich v- v- from Signia had a, a really good point on, on Bruce Whitfield's show last night. She said, well, you know, this whole prescribed assets from the government um, is a stupid idea. Why not rather, for example, get the PRC to issue, uh, get ESCOM to issue a 10-year zero coupon bond to the PRC for 100 billion. The PRC can afford it. Uh, they'll take a small hit, but they'll survive. Um, and it will remove a significant portion of interest payment for ESCOM for the period. We're going to need some clever ideas on how to get ESCOM stable um, more than anything else. You know, cheap electricity would be nice, but we need ESCOM stable. And the trick is, is how bad is 2019 going to be? How bad is load shedding? Are we going to have it, the frequency? And that remains a large risk and a large unknown. Certainly we, as I said, got some in early December and then it, and then it, it disappeared. Uh, things seem to be stable at this point, but it's not even a hop, skip and a jump. It's a, it's a slight little slip um, and suddenly things start to get ugly there and hurt and hurt immensely. Yeah, it, a lot of 
a lot of large industry and large retail shopping centers and, and manufacturing and the like have, have gone off grid. They, they've got capacity for if there's load shedding. If they're not totally off grid, they've got some sort of generative ability to create their own electricity and the like. Um, but it's consumers. It's the smaller uh, mom and pop stores, etc. It's the more directly SA Inc. who's going to get really hurt from the ESCOM story. So th that is our big risk. The light's going off, absolutely without a shadow of a doubt. Fangs, uh, which all entered bear market at the end of last year. Some have recovered. Let's touch on them each. Facebook, I think, has got regulatory issues. When you, so the idea, you know, Facebook does a couple of things. Firstly, what it does is it checks, you know, and Google does this too. It checks who I am and what I click and what I like and what I search for and what I respond to. And the theory being so it can show me relevant ads. And that's not a bad idea. You know, don't show me ads for nappies i have no need and i have no children and i know no children so you know show me ads that are relevant to me the downside of course is my credit card takes pain in it but that that's the right way to be doing it but they've not they've taken that step further where they've basically in, in a sense weaponized uh, uh knowing who you are they can control feelings they can control emotions um and therefore they they have massive influence in elections and that is the key point you start fiddling with elections and you're fiddling with po with politicians' uh, paychecks, um, and I think we're going to see some regulatory issues there. So Facebook doesn't throw me. Uh, Instagram, WhatsApp, probably significant less of an issue, but Facebook, I think, has has significant regulatory issues ahead of it. Alphabet uh, used to be called Google. Uh, they got regulatory issues, I think, in time. EU more than the US, and that's because of the distinction between how regulatories w regulations work in the, or, or sort of uh, uh, anti-competitive work in the two spaces. In the US, it's very much, is, is your anti-competitive hurting the consumer? In the EU, it's very much, is it hurting businesses? Um, and Google via Chrome, uh, a browser via its uh, Google search engine is significantly more dominant in the EU than it is in, in, in the US. In the EU, I think uh, uh, it, it's sort of 70 plus. In the US, it's around 50%. Still dominant, but more so in, in the EU. Apple is changing, is maturing. We saw the trading update that came out um, during December when they were talking about slowing sales. They announced that their last set of results that they wouldn't break out unit sales. They would just give revenue. And they were changing, maturing business. And, and this is what happens. And in fact, my Finwee column later this week talks exactly about that. Um, you know, they've had two massively innovative products, the iPod and the iPhone. Uh, since then, they've had other products. You know, they've, they've, you know, they've got the iPad, they've got the Apple Watch and others, but none of them of the scale of the iPod and the iPhone. And they're unlikely to, to, to get another one, truthfully. Uh, most companies never have one. Few have two. I mean, how many companies have had three innovative products of the level that Apple has had? I, I can't think of any. I've been scratching my head for a couple of weeks around it. So Apple, I think, is 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 you know your 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 massive growth is slowing, but you know they're still a a huge company with a humongous pile of cash that they're sitting on. They still sell a vast number of overpriced phones. If you look at profit per phone, Apple is like numbers one to seven, I think, before Samsung initially sne sneaks in they make more profit apple than the rest uh, on iphones than the rest of the mobile phone industry put together because of their massively high margins services which is the app store and the like and apple music and everything else in and of itself could be a standalone business with massive revenue um amazon's just a machine so do they get regulatory issues well in the u.s no because they 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 are saving consumers prices and that's the focus for for the, the sort of anti-competitive space um so you know amazon has 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 had a, a, a number of years now there was complaints about lack of profit the last number of years they've been making serious profit um they also know probably too much about us, more so if you're an American and you've got Amazon Prime. But of my pick here, it would be Amazon and Apple. Netflix has pushed up prices, uh, lots of people hating on it, but still the price we pay for Netflix. And I think it was only a U.S. price increase. The, the price that is paid for Netflix is way cheaper than anything else. The challenge that Netflix has is that when they started and they were pretty much the only one around, well, with Hulu as, comp as competition, they got rights to everything. Now, for example, Disney at the end of this year is going to launch their own standalone app, um, and therefore Disney product will get yanked off Netflix. And we're going to see more and more of that, where Netflix will have a couple of the smaller production houses' content and their own content. So in other words, we're going to have to sign up for multiple 
uh, streaming services or be content with having limited access to the content. So let's look at some 2019 going forward. We've got elections in May, likely to be May. It's, it's the preferred month of the ruling party for it. Uh, elections are messy. Uh, politicians will be dissing all and sundry, basically, as they try and hang on to their own job. ANC got 62% in the last national election in 2014. Uh, some people are saying they'll go under 50. There's zero chance of that. I, I expect them to probably still get around that 60%. Part for a couple of reasons. The opposition parties are in absolute disarray. Hey, the ANC is not looking much prettier, but, you know, who's going to eat their lunch? I also think that five years ago, we saw a lot of people switch out of the ANC to EFF. We saw a lot of ANC voters say, you know, no to, 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 to then President Zuma. And I think a bunch of them might then return. We've also got a ton of small parties. I was reading something over the weekend. I think something like 260 odd parties registered in South Africa. Now they've got to pay 200k to get onto the national ballot, um, and therefore a lot of them won't get onto national ballot. But a lot of these small parties are, I think, hoping that they can get a seat in parliament, which is a nice cushy job, uh, and you get a nice retirement benefit from it. Uh, usually it's just for their leader, maybe one other person. Um, and if the ANC did, did drop below 50%, they could become kingmaker. But it's going to be immensely messy, but I think the ANC can hold on to a, a 60%. And, and there's no chance of, the only chance of the ANC getting below 50 is with massive vote rigging, uh, and we're unlikely to see that. The IEC is too good. But it does mean that between now and May, man, there's going to be, I mean, the current panic everyone's having is about the nationalization of the Reserve Bank, which is neither here nor there. As a shareholder of the Reserve Bank, basically you get a 10 cent dividend on every share. You're capped at owning 10,000 shares. You get invited to the AGM where you get a cup of tea and a biscuit and you can listen to the governor and if you're lucky you can get a, a selfie with them. And it's an amazing building and it's probably worth being a shareholder and heading along, but you can just go along anyway and, and, and just attend and see the building and get the selfie with the governor. Um, the, the, the shareholders vote for one of the nine governors and uh, or deputy governors out of nine, and uh, this isn't the only deciding vote. The, 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 the shareholders are, are, are powerless at the Reserve Bank, but expect there to be a lot more of this from every direction, just because the elections are messy. Our rating, the question is, will we hit full junk status? And it's only Moody that is keeping us out of full junk status, and we've got two feet in already with Fitch and S&P uh, Dow Jones Global. Um, I think that Moody's is typically fairly gentle and, and, and forgiving in a sense. And I think if they've not junked us by this stage, assuming ESCOM can keep the lights on, I don't see Moody dropping us to, to full junk status, which means that we are hanging by a thread. There are still some indices uh, and, and some investors in, in, in sovereign bonds who can't invest in our bonds now that we have two junk statuses. Um, but the big one is if we lose all three and then our full junk. At this point, we're hanging on, and I expect that we can probably hang on during 2019. Uh, VAT, the increase last year was nasty, was painful, it hurts, uh, it's a regressive tax, um, but I don't think we're going to get another VAT increase this year. We're pretty much sitting a fraction below at 15% below the global average. If we looked at developed markets, uh, we, are, we are below, and if we're looking at developing markets, we're at or slightly above the average. The trick is it's going to be a monsterly tough budget. I don't know how Tito Mboweni is going to do it. He needs money for ESCOM, he needs money for SAA, he needs money for SABC. Those are just the first three that come to mind. Uh, not small amounts of money. You know, SAA, what, needs another 10 or 20 billion. SABC needs about the same. Uh, ESCOM just needs the entire treasury. And in an election year, so he could raise the top rate from 45 to 50%. Nice, but that's not going to make him enough money. He could raise the corporate rate. I don't. I mean, I just don't know how he how how he jiggles it. Fortunately, he earns the big bucks and he gets to do it. It's not ours to worry about. But it is going to be budget. Is someone's asking? Budget is twenty February, um, which is the budget. So mm, just uh, five weeks today. In fact, five weeks today is is, is budget, um, and it is going to be exceedingly messy. Uh, we'll see how he does it. The, the big challenge is not just the lack of revenue and high costs. Uh, it is election year, so therefore keeping voters happy is going to be a big challenge of his at the same time. Um, 
Peter asks full junk status for that close our stock market. No, it won't close the market. Uh, what it will do is it will significantly hurt SA Inc. stocks. Um, it will probably see a flight of money out, which will hurt the czar. Uh, and what will then do is it will help the dual listed and those companies that are earning in US dollar, uh, which is the majority of the top 40. So oddly enough, it might not be terrible for the top 40 because the RAND will crash and about two thirds of the top 40 makes its money offshore. Uh, it will be horrendous for your SA Inc. stocks. SA Inc. stocks will get absolutely slaughtered in the process, but the market will continue to trade. We, we don't shut down for, for just a downgrade. So the RAND, I'm looking to call it stronger. 1372 today. Uh, this chart goes all the way back uh, to what, 1992, I think it goes as far back. And what we see with Hazar is massive blowouts and then recoveries and massive blowouts and recoveries and massive blowouts. And if you look at this recovery we're staring at now, notwithstanding it's taking longer, it very much fits with what we've seen back in 2001. It very much fits in the 1998, although that then flatlined and then uh, uh, boomed out again. A couple of points. So the RAND fair value is somewhere between 12 and 14, depending who you ask. Uh, but the RAND spends most of its time outside of that fair value range, um, as we see in the spikes up here to 18, and the spikes up there to 1360, and the spikes up there to 12. Um, but we also then see the spikes down. You know, massive moves here. Yeah. In 2001, 1360 down to 575 was, was the low there. Uh, in the financial crisis, 12 and change down to sub seven. I've been saying it for years and I still think that Azar can get sub 12, maybe even sub 10. That's uh, yeah, I, I don't run around saying sub 10 because people think I'm totally crazy and it's gonna take years and years. The key point is draw a line through all of this. What you get in our currency is about a 2% per year depreciation against the US dollar, which is broadly the difference between our, interest, uh, our inflation rates, which is what the currency should do. It just doesn't do it in a straight line. The one caveat here, of course, is a, a, a ESCOM turns us off or downgrade to full junk. We'll see a much weaker czar, um, failing which our market is attractive at current valuations, our bonds are attractive at current valuations, and in orders for foreigners to buy them, first they need to buy the czar, and that will see it strengthen. Here's top 40. So we are literally trading back at levels. This is from early this morning. We are trading back at levels of mid-2014. Uh, in December, this is a monthly chart, we were trading back at levels from early 2014. Our market has gone nowhere in four, almost four and a half years. And, and the key, what does that mean? Over that period, earnings have increased by the stocks within the top 40. They, they haven't increased a lot. Lex said that they have increased, Lex say earnings have increased 30%, not annualized, 30% in total over the four and a half years, which is a middle single digit, five or six percent a year compounded over that period, about 30% Lex say. It's a thumb suck number, but you get my drift. But you're paying the same price, but you're getting 30% more profit, which says that market is 30% cheaper, put the other way. Now we can argue that maybe the market was expensive in 2014. It's hard to argue that our market is expensive right now. Yeah, d depending who you speak to, um, Joseph Busher from J.M. Busher and Associates reckons we are about 11% uh, undervalued below fair value for our market at the moment. And remember, a market will go from cheap to expensive. Um, Wayne McCurry was saying that we're as cheap as we were in 2008, if we look at uh, uh, forward PEs and the like. Our market is cheap. Um, caveat, I said that a year ago. I did this exact same presentation uh, to the exact same group of people, and I said then it was cheap. Um, and, well, yeah, we ended up down, uh, what, 10 12% for calendar 2018. The point is, I don't know when it's going to go higher, but eventually people start buying cheap. Because you know, as an investor, what do you want to do? Well, you want to buy the cheap stuff and sell it when it's expensive and sell the expensive stuff and buy it back when it's cheap. And we are. And at some point, the world is going to start buying us. Uh, globally, foreign investors were net sellers of bonds and equities on the JSC last year. Uh, I forget the number. I think it was about $150 billion, which sounds like a lot, but it's about, it's about a, two weeks of, of, of trade activity on the JSC. Um, and then I've put this chart up every year for a couple of years, and you know, are we Brazil? Um, and what happened in Brazil was, you know, downgrade, full downgrade, currency collapses, et cetera. And then the market went up 100% from early 2016 through to end of last year. Um, and, and at some point, 
our market cheapness means that folks are going to buy it and we stay and start reaping the returns. No market goes sideways forever. And someone's asking the question, uh, Tobias is saying, what about the Nikkei 225? And it's a great question. So the Nikkei 225 peaked sometime in the early 90s, I think, or late 80s at about 40,000 points and is now trading at 20 odd thousand and has never recovered. 100% correct. However, from the 40,000, I forget exactly what the low was, but the low, I think, was sub 10,000. Since then, the market has rallied two or 300%. Hasn't beaten the highs, but has certainly rallied hard. Um, I am bullish on our market. I was for 2018. I was wrong about that, um, but I, I remain bullish on our market. My, my sense is, is, that, is that I don't see how it gets down to, to sort of sub you know, 42,000. Even if I said if ESCOM turns off, well, if ESCOM turns off, we, we, our batteries go flat and no trading happens. Um, downgrades weaken the rand, which see us boom uh, because of the, 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 the heavy US dollar expectations within our market. Um, the valuations to me say ultimately we're going to start moving higher. <clears throat> Another risk we have is an El Nino happening next year. Well, this year, sorry. Uh, it's currently, so I can't find any any data for us, but uh, Japan and Australia are both saying a 70% chance of El Nino. A uh, couple of important points. It doesn't hurt the Western Cape because they are on a different rainfall pattern. Um, and we're not looking like the drought that we had a few years ago, which was uh, the worst in 100 years. This is expected to be a single season drought, but that's going to have some implications. Those implications are going to be rising uh, wheat and maize prices. We're already seeing that happening. That obviously then feeds into uh, higher goods that we then buy to eat. So our food, our chicken, which eats maize, our bread, which uses wheat, et cetera, et cetera, all becomes a little more expensive. Two quick points on that, and one I'll come back to in a lot more detail. Um, the South African consumer is not as stressed as, as, as anecdotally people say the South African consumer is. And how do we know this? Well, we can look at debt levels. We can look at impairment levels from the big banks, which is sitting at somewhere between 04 and 0.8%, which is way down on, on, on historical bad levels. During the crisis, we almost got to 2% impairment levels. The reason for that is our Consumer Protection Act, the National uh, Credit uh, Regulator, and, and, and the bank's inability to lend as, as much as they did up to the 2008 crisis, which has meant less debt. Now, the consumer is under pressure from VAT. The consumer is under pressure from petrol price increases, albeit they've come back down. Um, but they're not as pressured from debt as we were 10, 12 years ago as individuals. And, and that, that gives us a bit of cushioning space in a sense. The other important point here is that uh, if we take ShopRite, for example, and you look at their last set of numbers, they had a number of issues, uh, some of their own, a strike happening at their Gauteng distribution center and the like. But they also had 11,000 products that had experienced deflation. And what that means is that the revenue through the till on those 11,000 products is less than it was a year ago, but your costs are up. You're paying more to ESCOM, you're paying more to rent, you're paying more to your staff, you're paying more for marketing, and that puts a squeeze on your margins. So in truth, rising food prices will hurt, but it's going to help the retailers recover margin, particularly in the food space. SA Inc., as I say, is cheap. I'm not expecting a recession this year, except I'm also not expecting booming GDP, maybe 1%. Um, the easiest way to capture this is uh, uh, nice ETFs, uh, the Corsair's top 50, the equal weight, even just a good old-fashioned Satrix 40. Whatever your preferred uh, 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 top 40 is, um, is absolutely probably the one that that's worth taking. Um, a, a quick point coming through, I'm going to touch it now. Warren Buffett says best holding period is forever. He's thinking about dividends. Um, dividends really are your share of the profits. And, and what's interesting here is what we have seen in the top 40 is our dividend yield has gone up because, as I say, profits have increased. Therefore, dividends have increased. And dividends is just your share of profits that get paid to you in cash every single year. Um, and we've seen that yield increasing on the top 40. We've therefore seen it increasing on the ETFs. The ETFs pay a lot smaller dividend than the top 40 because that's where the issuers take their fees from. Uh, someone's saying, what about the, yeah, so the, is it, I think it's, so, so there are three vanilla, so there are four vanilla top 40 ETFs. There's a Signia, there's a Satrix, there's an Ashburton, and there's an RMB, no, sorry, not RMB, Stanlib. They're all the same. So whichever is cheaper in terms of total expense ratio, which is, as I understand, is Satrix, because they've dropped their TUR to 0.1%, uh, 
and that's therefore the one that you want wanting to be buying I, i'm not doing anything special in terms of my top 40 exposure i always have been buying i still hold i hadn't sold i have that exposure i continue to hold it Industrials have a lot of SA Inc here, but really a lot of it is NASPAS. Uh, NASPAS really is Tencent, and Tencent is China. A couple of things on Tencent. It was expensive. It's now cheap. Uh, what we also saw was the restrictions on releasing new games as the gov Chinese government was cracking down on the registration process. They have now got the process going, and games have been released into the Chinese market, albeit the first tranche included zero games from Tencent. What was interesting is that when they got the crunch happening, Tencent suddenly started making money in all sorts of other places. It's as if they made money from games and didn't worry about anything else. And then suddenly, when they couldn't make money from games, they realized that they had uh, classifieds and they had money lending and they had all sorts of other things. WeChat's a machine, a billion people. And, and WeChat's not WhatsApp. WhatsApp is a, is, a, is a messaging app which we communicate with friends and, and, and groups and all of that sort of stuff. WeChat is way more you can bank in that you can order food in that you can book appointments in that you can do you can get your your i think it's dd which is the chinese equivalent of uber and that's all happening with within within wechat um <clears throat> so i think naspass is, is is probably looking fairly uh, valued but the problem with the industrial is just that concentration risk and we have it already in the in the in the top 40. um Richmond gets is, is 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 in there. Mr. Price, Shoprite. Uh, my preferred picks is probably uh, Shoprite and uh, City Lodge in this space. I'll touch on City Lodge in a moment as to why uh, Shoprite, just because of their bad year and uh, inflation in the product, will help their margins recover. Construction, manufacturing, I continue to stay away from. Construction, I, you know, the, the, the construction is just really, really in a tough, tough space. Um, and at 1% GDP growth, where's the money going to come for construction? So it's still avoiding those particular, but there is some interesting SA Inc. that sits in the industrials. Financials, uh, flat 2018, still very low impairments, still very strong balance sheets. And probably if we look at the three sectors, Resi, Industrial, uh, Finney, and if you throw the mid cap into it, Finney would be my preferred sector. Uh, you can go with the ETF, you can go with any one of the big four. I hold uh, Capitec, but it is expensive. Uh, most of the peeps I'm speaking to have Standard Bank as their preferred of the big four. Uh, Coronation is one I've been building a position from um, uh, December, uh, and you can buy it on a 10% on a dividend yield. And what I like about Coronation is a 10% dividend yield means I'm basically getting paid 10%. Let's say they have a tough year and they cut their dividend 20%. I'm being paid 8% dividend yield, which is higher than I get for money in the bank. And I have the optionality of Coronation starting to make better money. Um, they've had a tough time. They've managed to hold on to assets under management better than one would expect. It has slipped, but not as much as one might expect. Their funds were having a tough time, but looking at Q3 data for 2018, I haven't yet seen Q4 data. They are starting to recover their performance. Their Market cap relative to assets under management is at historical lows. Um, if we took the long-term average, the share price should be closer to 60, 65 bucks. If they start earning, they earned in the last set of results, they earn about 0.6% of assets under management as profit. If they can start getting some performance bonuses and the like come through, we've not only got that incredibly chunky dividend yield, um, but we've also got the very, very uh, increasing in share price and potentially dividends going through. Um, and it's one of my top three picks for the year. That, ShopRite, and City Lodge are my three top picks for 2018. Resource stocks, the commodity oversupply mostly gone. Trade wars, if we get full-blown trade wars, takes China out of the equation, and then we will have oversupply of commodity because China is predominant demand. If we have China slowing, uh, same story, Chinese demand would disappear. Um, so there's certainly risk here. Uh, oil probably in the 60 to 70 range is about fair for the year, which is about, at that point, most people are happy. Most producers are making money. Um, I think Saudi Arabia balances at 60, so they're happy. Um, your, your big three here is either Billiton, Glencore, or Anglo. Billiton is my preferred of the three. Um, I, I seldom go into single commodity stocks unless it's, it's cyclical and the commodity is, is booming, um, and I don't see any of that happening. Certainly there is risk here, and in fact, 
the resource index was the best index of 2018 of the three, the Indy, the Finney, uh, and, and, and Resi. And if you throw the top 40 in the mid cap in, Resi came out top. Um, Platinum's still going to struggle. I don't see any significant change there. Palladium has been winning. In the old days, motocom manufacturers would uh, switch their cases, the converters from Palladium to Platinum. But a really good long article I read on the interwebs was talking around how the way they've tooled their factories, that switch process, which used to be a week or two, is now just fancy. It's not viable. So they're, they're in Palladium, which is mostly mined out of Russia. And to a degree, uh, Canada, we own most of the platinum. Um, I don't see what's going to drive the platinum price markedly higher. I, I'm, I'm lukewarm on, on, on the resis. My two positions there is Sassel is becoming less of an oil play as its U.S. operations start to get up to steam. Uh, and then Billiton, which is mostly iron ore and uh, energy, as opposed to Anglo, who's iron ore, platinum, and then some diamonds. Retailers had a tough 18. We'll start seeing retail updates starting today. We should get a couple coming through in sense. They'll, they'll start playing over the next week or two. Um, and we'll start getting more from that. The deflation has certainly hurt them. Uh, as I mentioned, costs are, are going up while, inc while income is not. But we do have quality and very well positioned. Yeah, some, yes, looking at you, Woolies went and did some bad acquisitions. But Mr. Price and ShopRite, and, and even Pick and Pay, Pick and Pay has been under a bit of pressure, particularly the last day or two, because a lot of their revenue is coming from Zimbabwe. But Pick and Pay seems to have got things in the right position now. Now they need to start growing the, 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 um, the, 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 the ah, Paul's didn't remember the word. They need to start growing their operating margin, which has been stuck at 2% ever since uh, uh, Richard Brescia joined, what, four or five years ago. Um, I've been in ShopRite now for some 15 years, having switched in the early 2000s out of pick and pay into ShopRite. Um, and I still like ShopRite. Uh, pick and pay to me was always too rich a valuation, in part on the excitement of a turnaround and in part on a potential takeover. Uh, turnaround's now starting to show some reward in that space. Mr. Price in the clothing space uh, just never puts a foot wrong. I, I lied. They did once, literally once. What was that? Two years ago or so. Um, they are just an absolute machine in that space. Uh, interest rates locally, we've been promised uh, increases by the uh, MPC. They might slow down a bit. We've seen petrol come back markedly, but certainly the MPC is of the review that the risk of inflation is to the upside, and therefore they want to drop some interest rate, interest rate increases, maybe another 0.75% over this year and next. Europe needs to start edging the interest rates higher and have announced the ending of their QE program. Um, and the U.S. is already edging higher, but might slow it down from expectations. The point broadly is that we're still sitting across the world um, at record low interest rates. They're off the lows in South Africa. They're off the lows in the U.S., but they're still at well below the averages. And you need to get those interest rates back into the average zone because when market crises happen, central banks use interest rates to defend, you know, to slash the interest rate and try and get things helping in their favor but you've got to have space to slash it, which is why Europe is on a precarious position. If they get a market crisis, they can't slash their interest rates because they're pretty much already at zero. China, the world's second uh, largest economy and still thundering along, but some concerns coming. So Apple... One of, their, one of their reasons for reducing uh, uh, growth was slowdown in sales, but then Richmond had really good sales in China. We see some bad data out of China, then some good data. A stimulus package announced overnight, which is means that the Chinese government is concerned, but means that there's some growth happening, that, that there will be some growth from the stimulus package. Uh, iPhones might have been around, you know, a, a middle finger to America and the, and the trade wars. The, the big picture, if we step back a moment, is that transition from industrialization to consumerization. And I've been talking about this for years and years, and it is ongoing. Um, but it is going to be bumpy. And if trade wars become full-blown, it'll hurt China, it'll hurt America, and it'll really hurt global economies. Um, and, and there are always concerns around China. Don't get wrong about that. This isn't a new scenario to see concerns around China. Are they more valid this time? It's hard to tell. The trade war certainly is biting, um, but we need China to be growing. And, and, you know, and, and heck, you know, people, if it drops to 5% GDP growth, the market will be terrified. But the second biggest economy in the world, chugging along at 5%, 
is huge. There is an ETN from Deutsche Bank. I get my exposure to China via Richmond and Discovery directly, and I get it indirectly via NASPASS that I hold in my ETFs, uh, local ETFs, and of course, NASPASS is Tencent. <clears throat> The U.S. Uh, March will be the longest bull market. Uh, it will be 10 years of bull market when it bottomed in March of 2009. Uh, it remains the longest bull market ever. The sell-off in December did not get bear territory. That's about 2,100 on the S&P for to be into bear territory. My view on the U.S. is that they're probably going to have a modest 2019. Um, I don't think we're going to see massive incre increases in equity. They might do some green. It will be single digit. There are a couple of ETFs out there, but if I'm right about the, the czar in, in, improving, that will then hurt the ETNs because you might get an uplift in the, in the S&P 500, but the RAND strength will then take the shine off for that. The question is, are they going to hit full bear? My view is probably, I th I'm still perhaps looking for some more downside to around that 2100 and then a move higher. Uh, and the trigger for the move higher for me was going to be all around China when I first started putting this presentation together and trade wars. But now they also have the whole big concerns around uh, government shutdown. At some point, Trump capitulates and the government gets working again. The shutdown hurts. It's a couple of billion dollars that are not going into the economy. If you're buying big ticket items, you delay it. But your trip to McDonald's is going to be cancelled and doesn't get picked up in three weeks' time when you are being paid again. So there will be some pain from the U.S. economy coming through. Over November, December into early Jan, it was all about the, the tech stocks and the fangs getting hit. In some cases, they are expensive. Facebook certainly was. Netflix. In other cases, Apple was cheap and is now just cheaper. But I do expect some more pain in the U.S. and I do expect what will ultimately be a modest year for the U.S. European Union. Um, folks, I'm seeing questions coming through galore, but I've lost control of them. I'll come back to them at the end of the presentation. Keep sending them, but I'll answer them at the end. Um, European Union is looking all right, and, and I stress the all right part. Modest growth, uh, ending QE this year, needs to start raising rates. We'll see how that goes. I think possibly offering a better opportunity than the US. Uh, Signia EU is, a, is, an, uh, is an EU ETF. It excludes the UK. Uh, the big components in there, obviously, are France and Germany. France has had a tough start to the year with the protests that they have been seeing. Um, I prefer the Signia Worldwide ETF or a Worldwide ETF in Ashburton 1200 or the Satrix uh, developed market. You've got Europe in there um, and you've got less direct exposure. You, of course, have 50%, 55% odd percent exposing you into um, the US, which I think is going to take some of the shine off it. But my developed market exposure, typically I just take via a global ETF. Brexit, well... I don't know. I mean, I don't know. So the vote last night was 432 against 202 in favor. The biggest defeat by a sitting government in the UK since 1914. Some people are saying the biggest defeat ever by a sitting government in the UK, which, and I don't know what that means. So tonight we have a no confidence vote and the polls I've seen coming out around that suggest that Theresa May will win the no confidence vote, but only just. And the reason behind that is it's one thing for an MP to vote against Brexit. It's another thing for them to vote against the government because so if a no confidence vote happens, 14 days to create a government, uh, that unlikely to happen. The Conservatives don't have a majority, but then unlikely to be able to get the majority of the UDP, um, which means an election has to be announced in 14 days, which means not only is the Brexit deadline end of March looming, but now you've got an election and MPs like to keep their jobs as you know, politicians. It's what they're there for. So I think she'll win the no confidence. But I honestly don't know now what happens. So the one view I'm seeing a lot of is that the, U, that, that the EU will capitulate at the last minute and give them a slightly better deal come 30 uh, 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 March. But there's some issues around the backstop, around, you know, I was, I was listening to a podcast and they were interviewing a truck driver who pretty much most days drives out of Dover, uh, across the channel on a ferry into France, delivers goods and goes back. And currently, there's wait times, and the waits are to get onto the ferry. But 10, 000, he says 10,000 trucks a day go through Dover. And if you just have a one-minute process in order to make sure that the trucks are allowed to exit the UK and enter the EU, 
Moldova basically shuts down. It just becomes gridlock. So I don't know how this happens. I don't know how it plays out. Fortunately, we don't have as a, as, as a, an economy massive exposure to it. The stocks that are exposed, yep, Breit, uh, Capco, Into, and those, uh, they're having tough times already, uh, and they're unlikely to pick up anytime soon. Uh, some such as Capco are cheap, sure, but they've been cheap ever since Brexit happened. What that vote was two and a half years ago three and a half years ago, how many years ago it was. Um, and it's, it, it's, you know, it, there's no need to rush. Let it all shake out first. So 2019, first some bearish activity. We're seeing pressure locally. Uh, we've certainly seen some, some, some buying in the U.S. But I think that's going to come off. Uh, I am bullish locally. I'm expecting RAND strength. The U.S. remains the global economy. It's looking fine. Will it have recession in 2019? Don't know. Uh, I think it depends on trade wars. To me, the, the, the big issue is all again to be about trade wars and if we can get peace in our time. So some stocks, uh, your top 40s, stay away from the mid cap one. The top 40 runs first, then the mid cap. So if we have a storming you know, 2019, and I'm not expecting a storming 2019, I'm expecting a stormy 2019. If we get growth of, of, in our market of around 10%, that will be fine. But we need our top 40 to rally hard and become expensive and get to 55, 60,000. And then investors start shopping down and we'll see mid cap starting to move. And uh, the retail space, ShopRite, Mr. Price, Pick and Pay, touched on those, Coronation, the Citrix, Finney, which is my preferred index uh, at the moment. Uh, property, which I haven't touched on, let me touch on that. Property yields, uh, Keelan and Glovel, who is head of listed property um, uh, funds at Stanlib, uh, property is cheap. We're getting yields of almost 10% on these ETFs. They've had massive pain. Yes, there's oversupply. Yes, yes, and all the other stories. But from property, which had a storming 15 years has come back to valuation levels which are reasonable. And the, the, the best measure is if your yield and property is above the government long, long bond yield, property's got valuation and worth buying. You're also picking them up at or around uh, 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 net asset values. If you want individuals, high prop and growth point are my two preferreds. NASPAS, I like it in part because we're going to get multi choice, in part because Tencent is going to recover. Um, People hate multi-choice, but truthfully, they hate it because they hate having to pay for it. Um, and remember everyone told you they were canceling their multi-choice subscription? Well, everyone on Twitter, turns out they lied. If you look at the last set of results out of multi-choice, they actually picked up subscribers. Multi-choice makes about 5 billion ZAR profit a year. It's going to be spun out uh, probably in the next three or four months. On a 10 or 12 PE, that puts it at about 50 to 60 billion market cap, puts it in the top 40. Is terrestrial slash uh, 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 satellite TV dying? Absolutely it is. Is it happening quickly? No. Look at the U.S. Look at the large suppliers of over the top uh, in, in the U.S. Over top services such as Hulu and Netflix are certainly uh, taking market share. But what I've seen in the U.S. And, and 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 reports out there, so you would pay $140 for Comcast, which makes our thousand bucks for 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 DSTV look cheap. Pay $140 for Com Com Comcast. You can Comcast, and then you've got to pay, you know, 14 for here and there and everywhere else, and you end up paying broadly the same. Multi-choice's big hole, obviously, is sport. And they're not going to give that up in a moment. Then the question is, will they spin out a separate sport package? No. <laughs> Why should they? Because the sport package would probably be 600 bucks, but you'll pay 900 or or 1000 and you get the ones you don't watch, but you're addicted to your sport, and so, hey, there, you know, there it is. So like it and like multi-choice. Uh, Billiton and Sassel. Sassel, Lake Charles is coming to an end. Uh, so those costs and overruns are behind them, so that pressure's off. They can start generating some revenue. The Sassel board is going to be gung-shy. They're not going to rush out and buy and do more big projects, which means that we can probably start seeing some solid cash coming through. Uh, they've got natural gas as a feedstock um, in, in, in Lake Charles. They're still producing oil, so they're broadly counter-cyclical. Oil price down, natural gas price down, which means cheaper to produce in St. Charles, but less for their, 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 their uh, oil. So they will evolve from being less of an oil play. 
City Lodge, uh, I touched on it briefly, why do I like City Lodge? Uh, it's a good valuation, it's a great run company, occupancy levels are quite low, um, and an extra bed night pretty much drops to the bottom line. You know, if you st if you pitch up at a hotel and stay there, their costs, yeah, their cost goes up a little bit. They they, they got to throw you some be some breakfast, they got to make the bed. Well, no, I mean, they're already paying someone to make the bed. You're going to use some electricity and some water. But the point is, they already had someone making beds, and now they just got to make an extra bed, and they already had someone checking you in. Now they've got to check an extra person in. So your cost is fairly fixed, and therefore as you increase uh, occupancy, you get massive leverage effect and it drops to the bottom line. Why is City Lodge going to pick up on, on occupancy? Uh, a slight increase in the South African economy out of recession, some GDP growth is going to start helping. Why are we waiting for that is an election. Uh, I missed a flight last year, so I had to stay in the Pineland City Lodge, and I was chatting with, with managers and staff there, and they love election years. So the big brass stay at the fancy hotels, but the foot soldiers stay at the cheap hotels, and that is City Lodge. What they also see a lot of is elections bring a lot of weekend bed nights, whereas City Lodge is typically business, therefore the Monday to Thursday, and then this brings in uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So they can have a better 2019 Picking up economy then feeds into 21 and 22. So my three preferreds, City Lodge, ShopRite, Coronation. ETFs, keep your long-term ETFs, max out to tax-free. Uh, budget on the 20th of Feb, we'll see if there are any changes. Unlikely, uh, 33,000 rand limit. Remember, the tax-free accounts run March to Feb. So if you haven't maxed out, you've got until the end of Feb. If you have, you can start again on the 1st of March. Buzzword for 2019 is going to be inverted, inverting inversion. These are bond yields when your long yield and your short-term yields cross over. Um, and we started seeing this word come through in early December. And there's going to be great excitement and great panic. And people are going to tell you how this spells doom. What we do see is that every recession was preceded by an inverted yield curve. But what we don't see is that every inverted yield curve resulted in a recession. So the peeps out there who say inverted yield curve means recession are wrong. We can't have a recession without an inverted yield curve, so we need to have that in order for the US to be in recession. But just because there is an inverted yield curve does not mean a recession. Ladies and gents, that's it. Let me take questions. There are a fair bunch coming through. Uh, let me get to them as we can. Uh, contact details are there. Uh, Kilbert, ShopRite, City Lodge, and Coronation. Uh, Sanjin, yep. Yes, so Sanjin, oh, great question. 10% yield on Coronation means I break even in 10 years. So if you buy Coronation now, and two things do not happen. Uh, firstly, the share price never goes up. Um, and the profits never change, you get 10% a year, in 10 years you've got your share price back, and now your coronation shares were essentially free, and whatever you sell them for is out and out profit. Typically a yield at that point doesn't last forever, um, and the yield will come down to say 5%, and there's two ways that yield comes down to 5%, earnings halve or share price doubles, or a combination of both. I'm not expecting earnings to halve, therefore I'm expecting some share price appreciation. Yeah, if the price never changes. Johan, uh, India, I mean, not a market I follow closely. I do know that the Indian stock market is dominated by the two resilient companies. The father gave one to each son. One is in telcos, one is in marketing and the like. Um, I know that they are going to become the biggest, pop are expected to become the largest populous country, overtaking China at some point in the next couple of years. I also know that for South Africa, uh, South Africans, it's very difficult to invest in India. You would need to use a web trader account where you can then buy Nifty 50 ETFs. Uh, Robert, absolute pleasure. Uh, John Luke, what about Pepcor? Yeah, so Pepcor's got some good assets, namely Pepcor and, and Ackermans. Their, their, their shoes, I think, is an overtraded market. Um, and the chappy who they bought the shoes from, and I, I'm saying shoes because I can't, are they Techie Town? They're Techie Town. He's gone off and made some competition. Uh, the biggest issues they have right now are corporate governance and associations with Steinhoff. Um, the corporate governance around loans and around non disclosures and their listing documents. And the fact that Steinhoff covers Steinhoff owns 60 odd percent uh, of 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 Pepco, and the trick is Steinhoff would love to not own Pepco. The problem is hard to sell 60 percent, and if they sell it, the money's in South Africa, and Steinhoff actually needs the money in Europe, 
Will the Reserve Bank let them move it out? But the market, I think, is concerned around that overhang of that large quantum of shares that will be uh, kicked out at some point. Um, Fritz, will I be covering overseas stocks in a webinar? Uh, yeah, we will do some of those. I'm going to do some web, uh, uh, web trader and, and US as well during the course of the year. Uh, Peter, my take on CFDs and single stock futures. Yes, but um, I have no problem with derivatives. A couple of points. Learn to walk before you crawl. Uh, you go trade equity. If you're not making money trading equity, why are you going to trade make money trading geared products in the process? Um, so, so be very, very cautious with the process. Um, use a small amount of your investment, you know, 5, 10, 15, if you really want to be aggressive, 20% of your entire portfolio can perhaps go into the derivative space. And personally, I don't trade, nor do I like trading equity. Too much single event risk. And I will, you know, if you were long break on Monday, that stock dropped 20%. If you were long Steinoff for a year and a month and a week ago, you're, you know, to me, it's currencies and FX, but leave the FX alone because that's where the pro. Sorry, uh, currencies and indices. Leave the currencies alone. Trade indices. Trade Ormi. Uh, head to online share trading. Under special announcements, you'll see webinar downloads. Look for the Aussie trading ones uh, and trade the Ormi at a buck a point. It's a great place to learn, and you can start learning with a measly ten thousand rand. Ladies and gents, that's it. No more questions coming through. We have recorded. It will be up on the website shortly. Um, ah, some questions coming. We'll quickly grab those. And then we'll be back again, as I say, next week. Uh, sorry, next month. Uh, max out your any advice. Uh, sorry, uh, Delray, let me read this. 200K left for the 18-19 tax season to max out my 27. Any advice? 20 years away from retiring. From understanding, you want to put money into 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 retirement annuity or pensions. Uh, therefore, you want the cheapest ones available, and they probably Signia or 10x. Go chat to them. Uh, they give you nice, simple, passive, low cost um, exposure to China via uh, CFR and Discovery. Yep, that's how I get my exposure. So, so Richmond obviously does a lot of watches in there. Uh, Discovery is our blue sky. They've got Pu An, which might be their 10 cent. Probably it isn't, but uh, that is what I'm, 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 you know, that's the little slice that happens there. We don't have a lot of SA businesses doing a lot of business in China, aside obviously from NASPAS. And if you own any top 40 ETFs, even if they capped, um, which is like to see top 50s capped at 10 percent, you've got lots of NASPAS exposure which gives me China. So NASPAS is an obvious route into China, but if you've got top 40, you've already got that route. Ladies and gents, appreciate your time. Everyone have a great day further. Uh, we'll chat again next month and we'll be back with our next webcast. Cheers all.